Okay, I still have nested instances of this somehow, which I don't understand. Sorry, say it again, Andy? Yeah, just I think you're moment. sharing Andy right now. Okay. He's probably seeing I'm himself. seeing duplicates. Can you guys do something about that? Uh, Emmanuel, you can... Okay. Yeah. Nice. That's better. All right, I think we're good to go. Good to go. Good to go. Great. Can I, before you introduce me, ask you guys to come up front? We're going to be looking at relatively small text, and it will be easier on your eyes. Trust me on this. If you sit a little closer, and there's plenty of room up front here. Welcome everyone to the EECS Colloquium. Our speaker this week is Andy Van Dam. Andy is the Thomas J. Watson Jr. University Professor of Technology and Education and a Professor of Computer Science at Brown University. He's actually been on the faculty um, at Brown since 1965 and he was the co-founder of the Computer Science Department and also its first department chair and Brown's first vice president for research as well. Um, he's a pioneer in computer graphics and HCI. If you've taken a computer graphics class, right? Well, we've been down. That is the book. <laughs> Carlo, are you still using it? <laughs> Every day. Every day. <laughs> Since on my shelf. Um, so his research includes work on graphics, on hypermedia systems, and on natural user interfaces, including pen and touch computing, of which we'll see some today, and also educational software. And so for decades, he's been building systems for creating and reading electronic books with interactive illustrations for use in teaching and in research. So please help me in welcoming Andy Van Dam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when it says in his notes, he's been working, what it really stands for, his team has been working. And today, in fact, it's going to be a team presentation. I'm acting as the impresario, and I'm going to let my students talk about the work that they are doing in my group. As you can see from the with part of this title, Emmanuel Zagragan is a PhD student who is about to defend. Bob Zelznik has been in my group as an undergraduate, as a master's student, and he's now our full-time director of research, has been for a while. And Luke Murray is the current team lead on the last project that I'm going to demo. Now, speaking of demoing, this is not your standard colloquium talk where I'm going to do a 50 PowerPoint slide deck uh, and present a lot of formal results, lots of user studies and stuff like that. Uh, for the first project, which Emmanuel is going to demo, Wisdom, there have been already user studies. The second project is so embryonic that uh, I would call it its Rev.6 maybe, not yet even 1.0, and we're nowhere near ready to have a formal presentation on it because we've done no user studies and in fact we haven't built out the functionality or even the user interface well enough. It really is work in progress. A lot of it came together just in the past month 
And so I'm a little hesitant to call this a formal talk. I really would much prefer that you think of it as stepping in my lab and meeting my team and sitting down and getting a live demo. Now, speaking of live demo, uh, we are live two-way, my team in Providence, and Emmanuel happens to be at a DARPA workshop where his system is one of the components that's being integrated. So he's, he's coming from Washington. Uh, but think of walking into my lab and getting live demos for my team, meaning in particular, since these are not canned pitches, that you should raise your hand, ask a question. They may or not be able to hear it. Can somebody ask a question just to see if the group can hear it? Anyone? How's the weather? Uh, did you hear the original question? Yeah. Yes? Slight, yes, slightly. Slightly. Well, I, I may have to translate, and I can tell you that yesterday the weather sucked. It took me three hours to do an hour and a half trip to the airport, and we got rear-ended. Uh, during part of it. So coming to Berkeley and walking around in your gorgeous sunshine <laughs> is, uh, is a real pleasure for me in, in many ways. So enjoy your weather. It's great. All right, so Virtual Lab 2 starts with my giving a little bit of historical context. As an old fart, I now have the luxury of going back in the Wayback Machine and telling you a little bit about how I came to be in this place running a group that does pun and touch computing. And uh, this starts in the early 60s with punched cards. Any of you ever encountered a punched card in your lives? Just a few and some of them from my uh, generation. Carlo in particular. So I used to walk on campus with a nice big box like this that represented my academic life. And every once in a while that box would get dropped and then you'd have to go through a manual sorting. But there were many wonderful things about the tangibility of that medium. In particular, writing notes on the back and sticking them in your shirt pocket. Great medium for that. But this was about as far from our current computing environment as you can imagine. Then what happened to me personally in about 1964, I saw a movie that changed my life. It was a movie by Ivan Sutherland about Sketchpad. And that is still, to my mind, I show it every year uh, in the first lecture in my graphics course, one of the best PhD dissertations ever done and one of the most impactful ones. And notice what's happening here that we still don't really do today. Bimanual interaction, a right hand, the dominant hand, doing small uh, precision gestures, fine precision gestures, the non-dominant hand moding, invoking different functions, uh, providing parameters of various kinds. Now, this is a little bit of wretched excess. You have to be an organist to be able to control that many interaction widgets. But still, imagine what a mind-blowing experience it was for people of my generation to go from punched cards and one run a day on the batch computer, if you were lucky, to an environment in which you could interact with a computer as a partner and communicate in the language of pictures. So it blew my mind in multiple directions, the chief ones of which were interaction <coughs> and pictorial communication going in both directions. One of the first papers I wrote was called Computer Driven Displays and Their Use in Man-Machine Interaction. That's uh, what the field was called before HCI, a more politically and more factually accurate title was uh, coined. So for me, it's always been about interaction. And the graphics has been f a means to interaction end. Now, why is graphics such an important part of interaction? Well, it has to do with Moore's law. 
when we consider this as the highest level block diagram of the system where the human component is part of the system. So we have compute engine, we have a graphics engine, we have a user interface, and then we have bi-directional communication in two different languages which you can treat from a language perspective. And what we want to do is maximize the bandwidth in that vertical line over here so that we get the maximum amount of information to and from the human component in the system. Fortunately, all these computing components, especially GPUs, graphics engines these days, obey this wonderful observation of Moore's law, but when you ask, how about the human, is there an equivalent? The answer is, alas, no. We're not going to grow any new neurons or any more of them than we already have. And at my age, you forget more than you learn. So what is our mission? Let's use all these cycles to increase that bandwidth to the human. And this observation of these two laws came to me from Bill Buxton, my valued colleague at Microsoft Research. Now, today, it's especially important to remember several of the many people who came before us, who in particular inspired me. Doug Engelbart, especially, he had his birthday yesterday, so I was keenly aware of that coincidence between today's talk and yesterday. And he invented our modern computing environment to a first approximation. He certainly led to the invention of a lot of stuff at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which we are still dependent on today. And from an interaction point of view, he really materialized a lot of ideas that we had in the post-sketchpad era about how people should communicate with their information, and our work still continues to be inspired by it. Another pioneer, Mike Weiser, a uh, name that is unfortunately not even as familiar to many people as Dung Engelbart is, who came up with this idea of the smart room, as it's often called today, with lots of sensors and lots of interaction devices and various form factors ranging from these little pads that you can see on the table to large format displays. And that is very much the environment that people are still working in today. So wonderful people to have learned from. Now, I divide the history of interaction with various kinds of devices into multiple waves. I'll show you one slide summaries of each of these, just to refresh yourself. Uh, and then I'm going to stay very brown focused. What did we do in the 80s and 90s? I'm skipping all the work we did before then. So let me just show you these summaries. The first wave where I'm featuring work done by other people that inspired us. Uh, most people have never heard of the RAND tablet. How many here have besides Carlo? Anybody? One person, Sue. Well, of course. Same generation, Sue. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not breaking any uh, protocols here by mentioning that. The RAND tablet was a very early tablet. There were multiple ones, and here you see Anderson's PhD work at Harvard, where he drew simple formulae. They were then prettified. This is the prettified version, compiled to Fortran. The Fortran was run in pseudo real time, and then you got an answer. And that was an amazing thesis, which I taught many times. Alan Kay, with his visionary paper that never had a for formal publication, essentially got us thinking about the idea of computing anywhere with a portable device that was graphics-based, that featured interaction, could be used even by preschoolers. And that situation today, of course, completely exists, and we take it for granted. We no longer look surprised when we see a two-year-old being a really competent computer user with a smartphone or iPad. We're not amazed by that. We should be in an era where computation meant walled off, glass balled off fortresses with high priests running computing machinery uh, where normal people would never even dare to enter 
to the ubiquity of smartphones and other form factors. That is truly revolutionary, and Alan was one of the key pioneers in foreseeing that future. A rich form of multimodal interaction is found in the early work by what later became from the Architecture Machine Group, the MIT Media Lab. This, this is Richard Bold and other folks using speech recognition, gesturing, uh, speaking commands, doing this kind of thing, put this there in a very natural user interface kind of way, again, pioneering work. The second wave saw a bunch of commercialization of many of these ideas. Most of these systems unfortunately didn't survive, like the Newton, which was brilliantly visionary, or the Palm Pilot. But we are living off the heritage of those systems. In the 60s at Brown, I'm now segueing to Brown-specific work without sliding what other people were doing elsewhere. We build what I think of as a very early version of Sketch, SketchUp that Google bought and has popularized, where with simple gestures that were interpreted probabilistically, we were able to uh, make 3D drawings sort of CAD-like drawings. Here you see a colleague of Bob Zelsnick, whom you're going to be hearing from momentarily, looking in stereo, using bimanual interaction, as Sutherland showed us was useful, uh, doing simple computer-aided design, which then connected with a numerically controlled milling machine at University of Utah, where they made the simple parts that we specified interactively. We got interested in tablets very early on. This is my then secretary's seven-year-old who was beginning to study piano, who was notating music on a staff, and we had a MIDI interface that would play it back. This application is still available online, and every year I get requests for it from especially uh, elementary school teachers. Now, the third wave had a lot of commercial products. I've listed them here, and they were much more com commercially successful than the second wave because they had much more compute power and the algorithms specifically for recognition had improved tremendously. The big difference between WIMP interaction, windows, icons, menus, and pointers, which is the environment most of us use on our desktops every day, and the kind of environments that I'm talking about post-WIMP, as I coined in the early 90s, is that WIMP is deterministic. You know exactly when a key has been depressed, whereas post-WIMP, gesture recognition is probabilistic, and you need to take into account context, and those algorithms improve dramatically over time, both for character recognition and command recognition. And in particular, we saw the beginnings of machine learning being used for getting better recognition algorithms. When I talk about pen and touch computing, what I mean is that we use the pen in a non-trivial way. So it's not just a substitution for the mouse. You can interpret the digital ink, and I like it especially when it is embedded in a multimodal interface where I get to use speech, I get to use uh, gestures of various kinds, both in air and uh, in contact with some surface or other, where there is gaze tracking, and sort of ubiquitous computing environments a la Mark Weiser. So here are some examples of modern day equipment. Uh, we have several studios in our lab, and I have one on my desktop, and we have one of these 84 inch pen and touch enabled surfaces that Microsoft sells commercially, and it's a beautiful device. Both of them really are. And we are continuing to develop applications on these devices. Historically, when we got started with tablet computing, one of the earliest projects we did after Music Notepad is one that Bob also was part of, which is Joe Laviola's PhD dissertation on MathPad, where, as you can see, you can draw a set of equations. They will be reified, prettified. You can draw a simple diagram. 
the two-dimensional math is interpreted. It is handed over to MATLAB or equivalent, some kind of math engine. And then we can, with very simple constraints, animate a little image like that mass on the spring and get it actually to animate in, in real time. And Joe produced a number of these simple physics simulations, all with two-dimensional drawings. He's still working on this. He's going to be a full professor this year at University of Central Florida. So MathPad was very influential in our development, and uh, it's continued to be worked on that idea. We also took two-dimensional drawing and gesture recognition into our virtual reality cave. Uh, this is a project in which we worked with the geologists, uh, the planetary geologists, to give them visualizations of Mars data from the various rovers and the satellites, uh, and integrated and show a pseudo-realistic rendering where you could do path planning and interact in a variety of ways with the information visualization. And that got us thinking along the lines that I talked a long time with Bill Buxton about, which is the idea that we still don't have, where you take your environment that you're working on, not your physical environment, your virtual environment, and you move it seamlessly between the various form factors that you operate with. So as you think in the shower and you do some notating, that, that gets captured, and then when you go to your kitchen and you use a different device, it's all still there. And when you go to your car, you have it available via audio and other means of presentation, heads-up displays, for example. And then when you go to a high resolution environment wearing headsets or to a cave you have more modalities but all of the stuff you did before is there perhaps with different representations we did a math pad like thing for organic chemistry recognizing hand-drawn diagrams like this produced ball and stick figures uh, did uh, minimum energy calculations to find likely confirmations and so on. That was another PhD dissertation. And more recently, we went back to the world of 2D and built a system called Touch Art Gallery for displaying arbitrarily large artworks. When I say arbitrarily large, the AIDS Memorial Quilt, which is the largest folk art project in the world, is 22 acres of stuff and it's too large to be seen in one place. It can only be experienced in pieces. Here you see some of the pieces on the mall and we did a digital version of that for an AIDS commemoration in uh, Washington where you can access each individual panel and learn something about who made the panel and what it represents. And it was also chosen by the Nobel Foundation to do a history of Nobel's life. This is a hypermedia history, so it's interactive video if you like. You can click while the presentation is being played and get additional information. And there's a more standard representation of all the laureates on the right all thousand of them today where you can click and get information and do various kinds of searches. So that's a little bit of our history. That brings us to current day and what I want to do now is turn the podium over to my uh, colleagues, my students, and we'll talk first about Visdom, uh, which Emmanuel is going to present from Washington, and then we'll do a newer, um, uh, even less P-baked for a smaller value of P uh, on dash. So with that, let me uh, switch context here and go to Emmanuel, who's up. You're up, Emmanuel. Hi. Hi, Andy. Hi, everybody. You guys hear me okay? Yes. 
All right, perfect. Um, yeah, so um, hi from Washington, D.C. Um, as Andy mentioned, I'm a PhD student in this group, uh, and I've been working on um, systems for uh, data exploration and data analysis. Um, this is uh, joint work with uh, some folks from the, the database group at Brown. Uh, Tim Kraska is my co-advisor for my PhD. Um, so this is a little bit of an overlap between HCI uh, and database uh, management, uh, data management and machine learning. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is a, a tool that we call uh, Wisdom, uh, and it is a interactive data exploration um, tool. Um, and over competitors such as maybe Tableau or Power BI, uh, there are sort of four key distinguishing factors. Uh, one of them is that we put a, a heavy emphasis on direct manipulation. Uh, so visualizations are interactive handles, uh, and you can touch and um, sort of almost playfully interact with data, as you'll see uh, in the demo in a second. Um, the second part is that we use a progressive computation to allow this fluid interaction style even on very large data sets. Um, and you'll see that in the demo as well. Uh, and then sort of more recently, we uh, focused a little bit on um, how can we integrate um, statistics into the tool as well. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the multiple comparisons problem and how that uh, relates to uh, visualizations. Uh, and then the last part um, that we, the reason why I'm actually in, in DC right now uh, is that we started to integrate machine learning operators as well. So basically what we want to do here is we want to enable domain experts, which are not uh, PhDs in statistics or PhDs in uh, machine learning, to still sort of have access to the, the same tools as um, trained uh, data scientists have. Um, and so with that, let me switch over to the, the first part of the demo. Uh, and here I just want to go a little bit over some of the um, interaction styles that we have in the tool. So this is uh, the system, Wisdom, uh, and it was uh, initially designed for, uh, as and you mentioned, these big interactive uh, whiteboards. Um, but it also works totally fine on smaller tablets. Uh, it works fine on desktop computers. Uh, so we use some pen and touch interaction, but we can also sort of emulate everything with the mouse and uh, and such. Um, so what you can do in the tool here is you can load a data set um, and then on the left hand side here you have uh, a menu, uh, A stands for attributes uh, and O stands for uh, operators. Uh, and if I click here on A, you'll see all the attributes that are part of this data set. So the data we're looking at here is a data set that contains uh, information about ICU patients uh, of Boston area hospitals. So there's things like ICD-9 codes, uh, those are disease codes, uh, then there's some demographic information, some physical information, and then a whole bunch of uh, blob testing results. So if you're, let's say you're, uh, you work at a hospital and you're interested in sort of analyzing the data of your hospital, uh, what you can do is if there's any attribute that you are interested in, uh, you can drag it out and drop it anywhere on the screen. And this is an unbounded 2D canvas, so you can sort of freely arrange uh, your visualizations uh, wherever you like. Uh, one of the key aspects of uh, Wisdom is that, as I mentioned initially, uh, that all these visualizations are not just uh, to look at data, but also to interact with data. So what that means is um, I can uh, create a second uh, copy here and then link these two visualizations together. And now if I select some data over here in the left visualization, then you'll see that we now sort of get a zoomed in version of the data uh, on the, the right hand side. And this is just a, kind of a, a way to uh, query a database, for example, right? So you can interactively create these uh, queries on the data without having to do any SQL or uh, anything like that. Um, and this um, interaction style works, there's different modes kind of, so if you, let's say you're interested in infectious diseases, uh, so here that's a dis distribution of patients who have an infectious disease and uh, people who don't have one in this uh, data set. Uh, if I select the infectious, uh, uh, part here and then slide it closer to uh, the age distribution, uh, then you'll see instead of the filtering that we did before, you now see um, the patients that we selected here overlaid in terms of the age distribution. So, and then you, we have different operations like we can normalize the data. Uh, and this might just help you to see that infectious diseases are kind of almost uniformly distributed across all of the uh, the age, age ranges here. Uh, whereas, for example, if we look at another uh, disease, uh, heart failures here, um, and do the same thing, uh, then you'll see that actually the sort of the chance of having a heart failure increases the, the older you get. Uh, and you can do that with multiple things here. So now um, 
uh, by the way, the, the color doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of a way to see where uh, which highlight is uh, is is used at the moment. So here in orange, we now see. Uh, the people with infectious disease and in purple we see the people with a heart failure and then in black here we see the people who have both uh, types of diseases um, yeah so this is sort of the, the high level overview of uh, the tool sort of the interaction style um, and um, let me just give you another quick example here um, with more of a maybe realistic question so let's say you are a, a researcher at a hospital uh, and the question you might want to answer is do people with a fever have a higher heart rate than people who don't have a fever. Uh, and this might seem obvious that, that there might be some correlation there, but it's actually, uh, we, we later on found out that uh, there's a publication in the medical journal that talks about this relationship and it's a fairly recent one. Um, so if you want to answer this question, the way you will go about that, uh, maybe in the tool here is you would drag out first uh, the temperature attribute. Um, and this is probably going to be really hard to see, but there's actually the values of temperature are sort of all over the place, ranging from 0 to 110. Uh, and there's a little bit of blue um, here in the, the 30 range. Um, so if you want to find out what's going on here, um, we can sort of use the same technique as we did before. Uh, and here, first, we zoom in to the, the range here around 100. Uh, and this is kind of what you would expect. Uh, looks like a normal distribution centered around 99 or so. Um, but then if we do a, a second sort of chain down here, uh, and now instead we select the range between 20 or and 40 maybe, uh, we'll see that that actually kind of resembles a little bit of a normal distribution as well. So what we found out just by using the tool and looking at these visualizations is that there's actually some hospitals in Boston that record uh, temperature in Celsius, and there's some that record temperature in Fahrenheit. So if you're interested in looking at the patients with a fever, we have to incorporate both of these uh, value ranges. So the way you would do this here is you would uh, sort of create a final visualization where we or these two chains together, uh, and then we uh, maybe select people with a high temperature here and people with a high temperature here. Uh, and now this final visualization sort of has everybody in it that has a, a fever. Um, and then if you go back to our initial question, uh, what you would do then is maybe uh, look at the heart rate, um, and then we can link this up. So now here we see the distribution of uh, uh, people with uh, a fever, whereas if we do the same thing over here, uh, we can then invert um, the selection here. So that just means instead of selecting people with a fever, the dash line means we select sort of the complement of that, so everybody who does not have a fever. Uh, and then you could go and analyze these two distributions and see if there's a, a correlation or not. Um, yeah, so let me, uh, for the next part, uh, go back to the slides real quick. Um, so what we um, what I showed you here is um, sort of the the interaction style we we, we have in the, this tool, um, and then we oftentimes when we uh, demo the system, we always get the question really quick: is like, oh, how, how does this scale to larger data sets? Um, and what we do what we did do for that is uh, we kind of bored the technique that uh, Andy can tell you is probably really old and used a lot in, in graphics, and it's the idea of a progressive computation. Uh, and it's used um, in a lot of different places. Uh, one example uh, I find interesting always is uh, it's used on, on websites a lot. Uh, for example, this is a screenshot from Facebook where um, instead of having the user wait until the full image um, is loaded, they show the user a sort of blurred out version, very small version that you can load really fast. Uh, and then sort of once the, the real full resolution image uh, is available, then they blend over to that. Uh, and this might help the user, instead of having to wait and stare at a blank screen to sort of do some um, pre-processing of the image, and maybe you recognize, oh, this is not the image that I wanted to look at. So we do something uh, similar um, to that, uh, but instead of uh, doing this over images, we do this over data. So what we do is if you have a really large data set, we first take a random sample of the data, compute the visualization that you want uh, over that sample, and then with uh, confidence intervals or error bars, we um, tell you how uh, confident we are that this is the, the final result of the, uh, your visualization. And then we take a second sample and update our um, visualization, uh, and if you do this over time, the error bars will slowly shrink uh, until you, at the end, get the final 100% um, accurate uh, picture of the data. Um, and we were interested in kind of finding out what, what this, we call these progressive visualizations, uh, and we were interested in seeing how um, these compare uh, in, in terms of user interaction to uh, other types 
types of visualization. So what we did is we, we ran a user study where we compared uh, what we call uh, instantaneous visualizations, uh, which is sort of, oops, let me go back here. Um, which is sort of what you can imagine in the in the, the perfect world. Everything you want to compute is instantaneously available. Um, so we we mocked off a mode like that, uh, and then we had a second mode where what we call blocking, uh, which is sort of the traditional approach of you just have to wait until the thing is computed. Uh, and then finally the progressive uh, mode, where uh, as I showed you before, these things um, progressively refine over time. So we ran a user study, and I don't want to go too much into the details here, but what we found is that uh, blocking visualizations um, are obviously maybe the, the worst, um, and the worst in terms of how many insights per minute user can generate with these uh, blocking visualizations, but also the worst in terms of user engagement. So uh, the way we, me we measured this through a couple of different ways, but one, uh, one way is how many visualizations did the users look at. Um, during their session. Um, but what's actually more interesting is that what we found is that um, we didn't find any statistical significant difference between instantaneous visualization and progressive visualizations, uh, which kind of led us to believe that maybe progressive visualizations are sort of a good way to approximate a world where everything can be computed instantaneously. Um, and uh, uh, we also did some testing um, so the, we did some user testing, but we also did some testing um, on the data side, uh, and this is some work that uh, Philip Eichmann did, um, or is in, uh, doing at the moment. He's another PhD student in Andy's lab. Uh, and again, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but one of the interesting things here, uh, we compared uh, Vistam's backend, which we call IDEA, to uh, other types of databases. Uh, here we, um, I'm showing you Monet the DB, which is a database that's um, designed for these type of analytical workflows. Um, and what you can see here is if you have large enough data, then uh, Monet de Bay will not be able to produce a result within what we call interactive um, thresholds. And uh, if you want to use that in a, in a tool, and you can tell you all about it, that the longer you have to wait for something to see, to see a response, uh, this might break the, uh, the human interaction loop. Um, so here I'll, I'm just showing you like a 500 milliseconds in a second, uh, and Monet Bay in most cases can actually not deliver a result within these time frames. Whereas if you use a progressive engine like the one we have, uh, you can obviously show users something within these time frames, uh, even though it might be approximate. Um, and for this, let me uh, switch over here again, uh, and I'm just going to show you really quickly how this actually looks like. Uh, in the system. So here we have a data set um, from a um, social networking site uh, called Reddit, where we downloaded some, I think it's around 70 million or so um, uh, comments, uh, and they all have a date. Um, and if I open this up here, um, you'll see that uh, when this is loading, it might be a little bit slower to network. Uh, that uh, we still, you get to see something really fast, but then here in the, the lower left corner, you sort of see a progress wheel that slowly, slowly uh, goes down to the full uh, accurate result, and we overlay uh, error bars here. Uh, let me do this again with something that has a little bit more uh, variance, so you kind of see the effect a little bit better, maybe. Um, so here we compute the average score for each comment uh, for different dates, and you see that this kind of jitters around, but uh, you get to see something um, which is fairly stable even in the beginning, and then maybe uh, over time uh, it converges to the actual full uh, accurate result. Uh, all right, uh, and uh, as Andy mentioned, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions on this. I'm doing a lot of talking here. <laughs> yeah, anybody got any questions so far? Andy, can you repeat that? I'm just asking if anybody's got questions, oh. and I don't see any hands raised. Bjorn has one. Yeah, so in, in this progressive visualization, do you ever run into cases where people will look at an early sample, make an inference based on that, and it actually turns out that's wrong because of how they interpret the, the error bars and the as the data, as more data gets loaded in, you would have actually made a different inference? Emmanuel, uh, yeah, um, so yeah, you were asking about uh, if there's any cases where people make wrong inference because of the, the progressiveness. Uh, and to, so actually in the user study I just presented before, we actually didn't measure um, uh, errors based on uh, misinterpretations, uh, just because it's kind of hard to tell. Um, we, we used real-world data sets, so it's kind of hard to tell if they, if they actually make a, a mistake or not. Um, 
But I'm going to dive a little bit into that question later on when I talk a little bit about statistics, because I think there's even before that there's sort of a bigger problem in, in visualization systems uh, and making wrong inferences. Um, but yeah, so um, there are some techniques even in progressive visualizations to uh, uh, get around that problem. So one, I think it was from Danielle Fisher at Microsoft Research, they did uh, something similar with these progressive visualizations. Uh, but there you can kind of tell the system that, oh, this is what I'm thinking I'm seeing here, uh, and then please let me know once the full result is available if I made a, a wrong inference. So you can kind of, I call these almost like visual uh, assertions, like the same you would do in maybe programming languages, uh, where you put uh, assertions in there. And then, and then if they get violated later, you, you might be uh, getting notified. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Let's take five more minutes. Can we run okay. till 10 past five? Is that okay? Sorry, say it again. That's about at 10 past them might be an X coming in, so 10 past is fine. But no. Okay, we, we can run the session for the full hour till 10 past five. So, Emmanuel, can you wrap up in the next five? So that Bob? Sure, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Um, so yeah, the next thing uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about is uh, 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 statistics. And uh, um, you guys probably have seen uh, interesting charts like these where basically random correlations between two things which should not be correlated. So here we have the total revenue generated by arcades uh, correlates with the amount of PhD uh, doctorates awarded uh, every year. Um, and another example might be this uh, XKCD comic where scientists are investigating if there's a relationship between acne and jelly beans uh, and they just go and test all the different uh, colors of jelly beans until they finally at the end see that all green jelly beans are actually linked to to acne um, so what all these uh, the, these two uh, examples illustrate is uh, what's sort of formally known in statistics as the multiple comparisons problem uh, and it basically states that um, the more inferences you make uh, the more um, the more likely uh, erroneous inferences are to occur. So here, what we uh, what we uh, plot here is the number of tests you do, and here on the left hand side is the uh, probability of making at least once one false discovery uh, or false positive. Uh, and you'll see that even if you do sort of only maybe 20 tests, you're almost uh, at a 70% chance of making at least one uh, false discovery. So th this problem has been very well studied in statistics and there's all these um, uh, correction procedures such as Bonferroni um, to accommodate for this problem. Um, but what we found is that it's actually very not well studied in visualizations. Uh, and what we did is uh, we ran some uh, user studies to kind of investigate the effect of the multiple comparison problem uh, in this uh, visualization, in visualization tools. Uh, because what we think is if you compare two visualizations like these two over here, uh, or you look at the shape of this distribution here and you compare it to the overall distribution, uh, at the end of the day, what you are doing is you are making some type of inference, which is actually pretty similar to uh, statistical inference. Uh, and we showed in, in the paper I'm, I'm citing here um, that there is a big influence uh, and that if you do a lot of visual comparisons, you run into the same problem as you would if you do a lot of statistical uh, comparisons. Um, and then the, the last part uh, I want to uh, go into a little bit uh, is the reason why I'm currently in uh, DARPA here um, is that we started to integrate more and more sort of machine learning operators. Uh, and this is kind of a little bit early on work here, but I'm just going to still show it to you. Um, so here we have a data set that contains uh, information about cars. It's one of these sort of famous machine learning data sets um, where you have things like uh, horsepower and weight. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to make it as simple as possible for users who don't have any type of background in machine learning or anything to sort of do the same type of uh, uh, machine learning as uh, experts would do. So what you can do here is you can drag out under operators, there's a thing called predictor, um, and you could tell the system, oh, I'm interested in trying to see if I can predict miles per gallon based on all other attributes uh, in the system. And then this in the background actually does fairly a complicated process. So this little box here, um, the, the whole research we're currently doing is around how, what happens behind this box is, um, and what we're doing here is, can you automatically find the optimal machine learning pipeline to solve the problem that the user uh, has given to you? Um, so there's a lot of optimization thing going on behind uh, this little box here. Uh, and then, but in the tool, it's still very, fairly simple. So um, we compute over, um, 
so the standard we split into training and testing and show you what the current uh, best pipeline, machine learning pipeline that we found, uh, how good their accuracy is. Uh, and then you can interact with these predictive values the same way as you would interact with normal attributes. So one of the things you might want to do is you want to visualize, visualize the prediction over your whole data, um, and then you can compare that uh, against uh, sort of the actual value, and then you see sort of everything that's off the diagonal here is where the, uh, the current model uh, did some misprediction. And then you can go in there and select a couple of points uh, and maybe further drill down uh, what's happening here, why the system is uh, mispredicting, and then give some more uh, input to the system on how to improve the, the current uh, model. Uh, and yeah, I think that's uh, all I have uh, from my side here. Um, uh, again, this is joint work with a lot of people at Brown uh, or at MIT now since Tim Kraska moved to MIT. Um, and yeah, let me know if you, you have any questions. Any further questions? Yes, one in the back. I'm curious about the decision to use this sort of empty canvas. Uh, it seems like the affordances of what's possible in the system are pretty hard to figure out, and many of the functionalities are familiar from more um, disciplined sort of layouts, like cross filters or menus of the system. So what do you guys think for this, this open canvas? Okay, the question is about the open canvas and the affordances, and I'll let the uh, questioner restate. Uh, yeah, so the question was with regard to, you know, the idea that um, many of the things you do are familiar from sort of more structured uh, uh, interfaces uh, where all the attributes would have been listed out, so things like cross filters or even spreadsheets. And I wonder why you guys went for this open canvas where it's, it's hard to sort of learn what's possible and see what you can do with the system. Has that caused trouble for users? And did you consider other interfaces that are more traditional? Yeah, and you, can you repeat? I'm not sure I picked up everything. Huh. Um, I handed him my microphone, Emmanuel, so <coughs> this is picking up in here, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to carry the... I don't want to use up too much time. To do yeah, the, the, the question really is about having this unbounded workspace and the affordance is not all that clear whereas in more structured spaces like spreadsheets uh, it might be more immediately apparent what the operators are. Uh, have we had any problems getting our clientele? And you should mention the uh, interactive gaming study to, to learn your interface. Can you just do that in a minute? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, uh, Andy Sun, I'm a, a company called International uh, Game Technologies. Uh, it's a Providence-based uh, multi-billion dollar company um, that is in the business of um, gambling, basically. So they, uh, they run a lot of the state lotteries in, in the U.S. Uh, and they manufacture uh, slot machines for casinos. Um, and actually, the system is currently, um, they're using this, their sy this system currently to analyze um, basically the log data from um, slot machines. Um, to see if there's anything um, I don't know uh, fishy going on maybe, or to design new uh, new games, um, uh, and they always had the problem that they were never able to sort of visualize their full data set because their data was too big. So they really like this uh, type of progressive uh, visualizations over their data. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, Andy, I'll, I'll let you answer the other question because uh, the unbounded two D cameras. I feel like a lot of our projects are using that. Uh, maybe a little bit from my side. Um, what we found a lot is that users actually do kind of like it a lot because um, they can sort of group um, their uh, visualizations into little subgroups and then spatially um, lay them out in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, and it might take a little bit in the beginning to for them to pick up on how the interaction model works, but usually they're fairly good once they got initial, uh, once they see an initial demo or um, a little tutorial on, on how to use it. Okay, I think we should move on. I'm going to skip a couple of slides, but give you the sneak preview. The next system, as I mentioned, P baked for a value of about 0.6 towards release 1.0. It's very, very new. 
and so you're not going to see a huge amount of functionality. The central idea is that we want to support note-taking because it's something I do, all my students do, and there really isn't any good system for doing it at this point. There are certainly uh, systems like OneNote and Evernote and Apple's note-taking facility for the iPhone, but basically they treat the note-taking process as something you do within their system and getting the full context of the things that you take notes on, let alone interacting with other applications that you might want to leverage, that's much harder in those systems. And we're trying to provide a rich note-taking system based on the hypermedia framework, unbounded canvas, and all those things that we've experimented with for a long time, where it's relatively easier to import information and to link up with external APIs. We're going to have uh, in this demo uh, see how we link into Quizlet to let you make flashcards after you've taken notes within our system. So the system is about rich note-taking in context. Bob, you're up. All right. How's our audio? Is this okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. So what you're seeing here is the Dash user interface, which is split into three regions. In the center, we have a panel zoomable 2D canvas where you can sort of do the obvious things of taking notes, dropping images in, making web clippings, uh, and other media types. On the left, we have a tree view, and the tree view is uh, used for accessing and organizing documents both within this workspace and in other workspaces. And then on the right, we have a uh, Chrome web browser, which has been enhanced with a plugin, which allows it to communicate with our application. Uh, any of the documents that we have on our workspace is backed by uh, some rich metadata or capability for rich met metadata. So if we take uh, the little orange dot next to a document and drag it off, what you see is a, a metadata view of key value pairs. Um, our model view controller paradigm means that if anything changes in one of these views of the document, it would update in the other view. So typing that, both of them update. Uh, so users can obviously add metadata by hand, but it's at least as important to imagine uh, capturing metadata automatically. So as users are taking notes, uh, browsing the web on the right and then taking notes about it on the left, we're in the background capturing some fine-grained links. So every note that we've taken is linked not just to the web page that was visible when they took the note, uh, but also to the scroll location. So if you go back to one of those notes and click the icon on the left, it'll take you both to the page and to the scroll location within the page. Um, so if we want to show some of the, more of the power of the system, we're going to switch to an empty workspace. And there's a search bar at the top where we can perform a simple faceted search. First, we're going to drag in the collection that we want to search over. So this is a collection of our own notes. And we want to type in the facet, which is that we're looking for some things of type text. So this will retrieve all of our text notes. We pull it out as a collection. So this is a nested collection on our workspace. We can view this in various ways. So this is a grid view. But we can switch over and look at it in a freeform view. And the freeform view is captured the uh, screen locations of all the documents in the workspace where they were originally found. We can tumble this again into a schematic view, which is kind of like a file system view of the metadata. Uh, we can do, again, obvious things like searching by modification time or something else. And then for each of the documents in here, we can see a preview of the web context when we took that note. So now cycling through each of these documents, we're seeing kind of a timeline of the web pages we were interested in taking notes about. Now we're going to perform uh, another search in order to make a structured view of some data. So we're going to do sort of the same thing we did before, choose a, a collection to search over, and we're going to search again for text documents. This time when we bring up the collection, we're going to look at it in a list view. And so this list view stacks all of the text documents we found on the left and leaves an open space on the right for us to customize a, a view of those documents. So in this case, when we took those notes, we sort of knew that for each of those notes, we had put an image near it. So what we want to do is customize the display on the right to show a representative image for each of the notes. So what we do is we make a text box, and we just uh, describe the metadata that we want to put in there. So here we're going to create a picture tag, and we're going to set this picture tag equal to a search operation, which is to find a document that's near the, doc the thing that we're looking for, and of type image. So near this is our syntax and type image. 
And then when we take this text box and drag it onto the body of this, it performs that search. So now for each of the documents in this list, it searches through our notes for an image that was near uh, the text that we had written. We might want to further customize this view with a quick summary. So we'll type another metadata field that we want to add, which is a summary field. We can drop that on the footer of this display. And now for each of these documents, we can review it and type some representative uh, summary sentence. A user uh, who's studying for some art history uh, exam might then want to quickly page through these things to make the association between the image and the representative text. They can do that within our system, but we think it's uh, more interesting for them to use an external application designed for this kind of flashcard activity, for example. So what they'll do here is bring up what we call a tab menu and search for Quizlet in there. When they find Quizlet, this represents an API to the uh, external Quizlet browser app. And what they have to do now is link up our metadata to the API prompts in this document. So what we do is we tumble our collection view back to a schematic view. And we line up our, the tags that we've created with the, uh, the API requirements. We take the picture tag and drop it onto the image prompt, summary tag onto the answer prompt, and we take this collection of documents and drop it onto the collection. We can give us a title and then send it off to Quizlet. So this will communicate with our plugin, and on the right, we'll see what uh, Quizlet produces. All right, so uh, for one more example, we want to show how we can use operators like uh, the Quizlet operator, but actually designed for doing text analysis. And so Luke's gonna take over the narrative of that. So this example comes from a uh, class that I took on Latin, and I was studying Caesar's Gallic Wars. Uh, the class, in the class I had to understand the first 10 chapters of Caesar's Gallic Wars, so I start uh, trying to understand this by dragging in the first 10 chapters into Dash. You can see the chapters outlined here and with some metadata attached to them. If I want to, I can view this collection in the grid view and see the documents just as I would text documents on my file system. But in this case, I'm going to view them in the schema view so that I can uh, play with the data a little bit. I can then bring up the tab menu to show a to pull in a sentence analyzer operator because I want to analyze uh, the context of these doc the content of these documents. Uh, I can hook up the input collection and hook up the document text and drag out from this operator. When I drag out, the system shows me a nice preview of the results, but in this case I'm actually interested in the data. So I open up the schema view again, and here we can see that the operator has output the individual sentences uh, along with a sentence length and a sentence score. Uh, in this case, I'm interested in the sentences themselves, so I can drag off of the sentence header. Um, here. Here, let me, I can tell it to a different view and back, and... It's a demo. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I can drag off from the sentence header, and here we can see that the system has recognized that the, um, that the column contains strings, so it's given me a nice vis visualization of that column as a word cloud. Um, I can drag off from one of the words in this word cloud, and here we can see the results, which is a filtered collection which contains only the sentences that have the selected word Helvetti. Uh, while this is a decent view, I actually want to see these sentences, so I can right click and select preview, and here on the right we can see the sentences with the selected word highlighted. I can go through these and find uh, the exact sentence that I'm interested in, and once I find that sentence, this, I can take this preview document and treat it just like any other document in my system, bring it back into my notes, having found the uh, information I was interested in. So that's it for the moment. Uh, we clearly have some work to do on our UI, uh, both to 
augment things so that we're doing less with typing, although we still feel that typing is an important part of the UI. We want to enrich the set of operators that we have uh, and see what people would actually do with them. And uh, we'd like to be able to include other things besides web browsers as part of our context, perhaps things like the Google suite of, uh, of programs and so forth. Uh, back to you, Andy. Any questions? I'm sorry this was a bit rushed, um, but we have a couple more minutes. Okay, so just uh, by way of summary, fairly conventional note-taking, rich text editing on the individual notes to give minimal formatting, nothing new there. Uh, but it's the underlying object model where each document is an object, a collection is an object, and the fact that we have this operator framework so that you can perform numerical computations which can be driven by a database view of the underlying model that we maintain. So this duality between seeing the thing as a normal graphical layout but also exposing the database nature of the objects that we're storing gives us power, particularly for doing computations with this operator framework. And the other key feature that I mentioned was that we are trying to link more to the external world so that it is note-taking in context. Bjorn. Um, oh, now I just dropped my, my train of thought. I guess my, my question was, you said this was an early version. And so, at some point of the demo, we saw a query language. You at, saw yeah, a query. A query language. And um, my question is, to what extent does your vision of the final interface have a textual query language? Or is it, does everything become graphical direct manipulation? Or do you always want to have preserved the way to say, well, maybe I can just type this out? So uh, I can answer that question very easily. We want the best of both worlds. So p all the people in my lab prefer typing because they're all fast typists and that's how they think. The thoughts flow out of their fingers on the keyboard. That's how they program. That's how they express themselves. I think mere mortals will much more use direct manipulation interfaces. We want both. Yes, Sue. So also that as you enrich this system um, and, and what you want to record are associations, that um, more graphical representations would be very helpful. Right. So uh, part of the system is concerned with building relationships. That's exactly right. We didn't show you the hyperlinking facility, which is pretty conventional. You drag the thing you want to be linked to onto the thing you want to link for, and you've got a link. There's also ex implicit linking going on when you select something from the web page and we record where it came from, not just the URL but the position on the page. So that's another form of hyperlink. Are we being kicked out, Bjorn? Should we leave? Uh, we're, we're good for Q&A. Okay, good. So uh, by all means, build some relationships via hyperlinks, also via neighborhoods. A lot of people love the sort of spatial hypermedia aspect of this class of systems where they can put things in particular places. Things that belong together can be grouped. We didn't show that either. Just like with the brushing operator that Emmanuel showed, when you bring them together, they automatically become a group. You don't have to do anything more than that. Uh, so there are spatial manipulations for visual recall that make relationships more <laughs> obvious, more explicit. Yes? So it's exciting to see this, something early like this because y you guys are, are exploring the power of your framework. Uh, I think it might be good to also think about some task-oriented uh, questions uh, to, yeah, to Before you go that, on, can yeah. you hear the questioner or should I carry my, no, I can't carry the laptop, it's connected. I think you just have to restate. I'll restate the question. Okay, go so, on. So the, it's a question slash suggestion, which is when do you, uh, or maybe it would be a good time to pivot from what's possible to what's desirable. So in note taking, what are tasks 
that we want to do during note taking and how would they lay out on the expressive power of the system? Yeah, what are the tasks in note taking that we've identified and how are we servicing those tasks in the ongoing development of the system? Uh, part of what you currently saw, this particular use case, was driven by the dissatisfaction of people in the group with existing note taking systems where, for example, in OneNote you can lay things out very nicely, you can establish simple hyperlinks. Certainly uh, the notebook organization gives you good structure, but it doesn't interoperate sufficiently with the rest of the world. We want it more. Hence our emphasis on having APIs that we can feed into. Another aspect that we thought was very important is sophisticated searching. None of the note-taking tools have particularly sophisticated searching. So you could see some of the faceted search here expressed textually, as Sue pointed out or other people did. You want uh, to be able to do it both textually and with graphical interaction. So that's another dimension that we have identified as something you want that we now have a partial implementation of. And the most important thing to us right now is get the system as it currently is without any additional functionality to be dog-fooded by the group. Because uh, the previous versions of a system like this, people said, you know, I don't actually want to use it for the stuff that I do on a daily basis. And I considered that essentially a failure of our system design. So the hope is that with this, since people put in there what they thought they wanted, we finally have something that will be good for dog fooding and then beyond for people outside of the group who have never contributed to any of the ideas. Partially, what we want is going to be driven by dissatisfaction with what we got. I hope that gave you at least a partial answer. Okay, anything else? I've got one more. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, so, both of these systems remind me of spreadsheets in one important way, and that is data first, right? What you see is the data, the documents, the text, and then the relationships, the computations, the transformations are kind of behind the scenes, just like <coughs> in, in Excel. You type in the formula, what you see afterwards, as soon as you hit enter, is the computed uh, value. And one thing that's an, an issue with Excel is that I think there have been studies that the vast majority of Excel spreadsheets have errors, but people don't catch them because the code is actually never visible. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you might guard against people specifying bugs in people's specifications and, and queries in these types of systems. Okay, let me uh, try to summarize that. Bjorn is noticing that we were in part inspired by Excel. We were, absolutely. And prior versions of wisdom that Emmanuel did before, which were graphical construction and manipulation of relational tables a la Excel. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of exposing errors, haven't thought enough about that, and uh, it's, it's an interesting topic. Uh, Bob, Luke, uh, any comments on the uh, way in which we might encounter the same kinds of errors that people make when they type, mistype formulas in Excel? Would that occur for us, and if so, how would we catch that? I think uh, it's that's definitely possible. It, we need to come up with a visual interface, or a vis we need to build out the UI to show that to the user. Um, for example, the Quizlet operator today could have failed, and we need to. Right now, we have a output to the command line telling us what's going on, but we need to bring that back into the system. Yeah, I think it's a particularly hard problem. Things like the near operator that we were using to find nearby documents. Uh, there's you know, every reason to believe that that wouldn't perform perfectly in every situation. And how you make users aware of that, uh, I think, is certainly a challenge that we haven't really thought deeply about yet. Yeah, good point. Any Great. other questions? All right. T.
team, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be staying here for a few minutes. Uh, happy to talk to any of you.